In this video, we're talking all about Pelts. Pelts' return. He dropped. <laughs> he dropped his whole thing back in February. Now he's back. Crazy stuff happening at the Walt Disney Company right now. We have a very special guest, first time on the channel, Mr. Seymour Duck, joining us to talk all about Pelts, Iger, and the Walt Disney Company up next on OG55. <laughs> Welcome aboard to another episode of OG55. We are joined by Mr. Seymour Duck, first time on the channel to talk about this Pelts situation. Seymour, thank you for coming on. Hello, hello, and thank you for inviting me. It's a, yeah, thank you for inviting me. It, um, I'm excited to talk about this. Yeah, no, th thank you for coming. It's, it's an absolute honor and pleasure to have you on, sir. If you could let everybody at home know where they can find you on social media. Yeah, they could find me on twitter.com slash Mr. Seymour Duck. There it is. Check him out. I will be linking his uh, Twitter or his X uh, down below and uh, definitely give him a follow. Amazing insight, uh, really interesting um, perspective. So make sure you, you follow Mr. Seymour Duck. And right over here, we got the Italiano. Is this George? I the, guess the, so. Yeah, I forgot to change my... <laughs> I forgot to change my title back. That's okay. No, the host of Citrus Corner, George. Thank you for coming back, brother. Absolutely. Glad to be back. And... Uh, talking some disney some uh some pelts <laughs> and all that good stuff uh but if anyone wants to uh, find me on social media you could do so on x formerly known as twitter uh at disney george you could also check out the podcast i'm part of called a walk with walt and of course you'll find me here on my home base at orange grove 55 with citrus corner with all that sweet juicy but sometimes sticky disney news and info there we go there we go <laughs> All right, perfect. Let's let's dive right into this topic. This is crazy stuff. Really, really crazy stuff. Okay, so this is from the Hollywood Reporter. Okay, it says here, activist investor Nelson Peltz eyes new push for Disney board seats after boosting his stake. Okay, it goes on to say here, the activist investor Nelson Peltz is making another play for the Walt Disney Company. In February, Peltz ended his proxy battle with Disney in a big win for CEO Bob Iger. But with the Hollywood giant stock remaining under pressure despite re reorganization moves, Peltz is eyeing a renewed push for board seats, according to a source familiar with the matter. And it goes on to continue saying that Peltz's hedge fund, Treon Fund Management, already one of the company's largest shareholders, has acquired further Disney shares, bringing the value of its stake to more than $2.5 billion with a B. Treon is expected to request multiple seats on Disney's board directors, including one for Pelts, the source says. Now, Seymour, I'll start with you. What are your initial thoughts on this, man? Were you surprised by this move? Not surprised? But like, um, where's, where's your head at with this? To be honest, I'm not surprised at all. Um, Bob Iger has been trying to do dr dramatic changes within the company, and I'm having a feeling that the board is not allowing him to do it. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so you feel he wants to go further. Yeah, but the board is holding them back. That's yeah, fascinating. You, you can see Bob Iger talking, like in the interview with CNBC, and letting everyone know his intentions of the changes that uh, he wants to do within the company. And I feel like he's doing that on purpose for everyone to understand where he's progressing Disney, because he has a he needs to do major changes within this company. Because right now it's not looking great. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. He, he needs to really shake things up. So it's it's interesting that um, okay, so that would that would be interesting because then it would be sort of like okay, so Bob Iger wants to do the change, the board is preventing him, so he would he would feel like almost like in a weird way maybe welcoming to this Pelse move, right? Because then exactly. he might. Get, that's interesting. That's an interesting theory. Uh, because so. I I have a feeling that a lot of people on the board is it's not progressing the changes that Bob Iger wants to do with selling some of the assets, with um, decreasing the costs. Wow. Okay. Interesting. What do you think about that, George? You think that, that that's a possibility here where, you know, he's trying to do this big change and the board is like, nope, we're digging our heels and this is the status quo kind of, you know, thing. And, and he's being really held back. That's actually quite interesting. I never really thought of it in that, you know, that way. Uh, 
of how I kind of took it was the first time around when Peltz initially wanted to be to have a seat on the board, Iger kind of pushed to kind of whatever Peltz was demanding that he was going to do, you know, once he would get a seat on the board, that's how Iger kind of pushed forward, you know, to say, okay, you know, I'm going to make some changes here or there back in February. And then Peltz kind of removed himself. So in, in my opinion, I feel like that if, if that was the case, I would have felt that Iger would have accepted Peltz back then. I actually personally feel like Peltz, Iger, and the board that's already currently there, all three of them are on completely different pages. Iger's not with the board. The board isn't with Peltz. Peltz isn't with Iger. It's almost like they all have their own individual agendas of how they want the company run. And I feel like that's where nobody is on the same page. Oh, so, so in a way, I mean, can we fully trust Peltz 100%? No, but I mean, who really can we at this point? You know, it's like we're all just going by hearsay. And no matter what, it's almost like they're, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, <laughs> like in that business. It's like right. everyone's out to get one another, but it's not doing a thing f best for the company. So yeah, it, I am curious that if he does get a seat on the board, maybe it is time for a little bit of a change. Because it seems like everybody that's there now, there's the needle's not moving. Yeah, they they definitely they seem to be stagnating. Um, I've heard um, from a good friend of the channel, Alia, actually that that she that she heard that a lot of the board, most of the board are like Isle um, Iger yes men, and so it's kind of like that's never good. You know, you 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 want a little bit of friction in there, and if that is the case, um, I would support Pelts. You know, putting a couple couple people on there to sort of mix things up a little bit. I think that you you get the best kind of results when you have that kind of push and pull. It's like government, right? Like it, you know, in Congress, you don't want to have like it, you know just like an overwhelming amount of either party. You want to have that push and pull. It forces compromise and what have you. It's it's a checks and balance. It's good. It's good. It's it it it, it leads to a better end result. Now, um, like Seymour here's the thing like what do you think um do you think okay so pelts he, his first go at this was in february right and now i i was kind of saying like back then like oh i don't know this is kind of it was kind of too soon i thought in my opinion because Iger just came back like around thanksgiving so he was only in there for a, like a few months you know and he and then nelson pelts comes in and he's like yeah you know i want to change things up and at that time i was kind of like well I don't know, a little premature. Why don't you give the guy a little bit of time to, to settle in before you, before you start doing the proxy war and all that. Now it's been almost a year where, I mean, next month it'll be exactly a year. My, my feeling has kind of changed on it. I feel like he's kind of, um, I feel kind of like Pelts has a little bit, he's on better footing because he has given Bob Iger a year. But what are your thoughts, Seymour, on that? Like, what do you think Pelts at the second go around, you think he's on better footing, worse footing? Oh, Yeah. He's on better footing, but what we need to realize is that there's a lot of things that's happening behind the scenes that we don't know what's going on with the company, what's going on with the boards, and I don't know if Peltz actually knows what's going on, and this is why he wants to be on the board, to understand if the company is going in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, no, that's interesting. Yeah, so so get so Peltz is like, okay, get me on the board, then I can kind of see what's happening here, kind of boots on the ground sort of situation. Correct. Well, and that's interesting, Seymour, because it's kind of like the same way. I kind of feel like that kind of happened with Iger and Chapek, right? Because remember, Bob Iger was very critical of almost every single move Bob Chapek made. When Iger wasn't in there, he was like constantly kind of like, oh man, Chapek, you know, there was a lot of that back and forth. But once Iger got back in November, you didn't really see Bob roll back a lot of the, the Chapek stuff. Right. So it's kind of like the Pell thing you're talking about. Once you get in there and kind of see it with your own eyes, maybe perspectives change. So I'd be very curious once if Pell does get a seat and or him and his people get seats. I'm curious to see when they get in there, their perspective on things, because it does change things when you actually are in the room now and you're starting to see the numbers and, and the rationale behind things. You know, what do you think about that, George? Yeah, I mean, I, I think honestly, it. it in the board's mind when all this went down almost a year ago where they they let chapek go and they thought you know what let's bring iger back because he was the 
the golden CEO, sort of speak. You know, he can get us out of this rut and what have you. And it's it's like, okay, well, now we're almost a year, but nothing is happening. So it's almost to the fact of now what is the next step to do? Are we going to continue just kind of in this moderate stage where like nothing is getting done? There's a lot of talk. There's a lot of wording of saying, oh, what we might do, what we could do, what we should do. But there, we can't keep on relying on that. We need to see change. We need to see movement. We need to see progress. And I, I as of right now, I'm okay with a little bit of change to see what Pelts could bring to the company. And maybe that's what it would take for him to get a seat so he can get a better perspective on it. Because... At, you know, as history kind of repeated itself, the Walt Disney Company kind of was in that same forte before Eisner and Wells came on board. Right. You know, and then you have someone who was from uh, Paramount and someone that was from Warner. They came in to a company that they had nothing to do with. They changed things. They shook things up and they did what they had to do that needed to progress from that time when it then when unfortunate wells is passing then that's when uh eisner's kind of motivation and and hunger for it kind of dipped down and then he also had his uh his heart surgery and what have you so i mean a lot was going on between that ending time but right. we still needed both of them during the time when we when the company needed it most and i feel like history is kind of repeating itself that maybe it, possibility pelts might be the answer it's it's possible i mean you know you kind of you, these kind of things are risky right because you never know where they're going to go and and, and that kind of it, it's a, kind of a perfect segue actually into what i was going to bring up here and that with pelts you know like i don't necessarily i'm not necessarily adverse to someone from the outside coming in and shaking things up because i think that's kind of good for disney every now and then like you mentioned george um michael eisner and frank wells they were outsiders and they came in they shook things up right Sometimes you kind of need that fresh eyes, the fresh blood in there to kind of make moves, right? Um, a lot of times these people get like entrenched, um, like Seymour we're talking about, like, he, you know, about the, the, the board not wanting to do like the, the big changes that, that are needed and things like that. Um, the only thing that the only issue that I'm having, and I'll go to, I'll, I'll go to you first, Seymour. Um, I'm very curious about your opinion on this, is that <clears throat> I, I like the idea of maybe Pelts coming in and shaking things up. My issue, though, is it says here, one thing that is not clear in the new Tryon effort is whether former Marvel chairman Ike Perlmutter is involved. Perlmutter, a friend of Pelt's and a fellow Palm Beach resident, was involved in the last proxy fight and held millions of Disney shares. Now, uh, Perlmutter and Bob Iger don't get along at all. They, From what I'm hearing, they absolutely despise each other, right? So I, my antenna go up a little bit with this, if he is involved in the second go around, because, oh man, that's, that's going to be rough. You have, when you, when like, you want to have, you want to have maybe friction and pullback, but you don't want to have just outright animosity. What do you think about that Seymour? You, you, do you trust Pelts if he's, if he's connected and bringing Perlmutter into this, do you trust him or is this, is this maybe a little more hostile than we think if, if, if Perlmutter is involved? Um, I think we should trust them um, because the changes needed to be done. Um, it, though we need to be a little bit skeptical if he did bring him in. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. Maybe cautious, cautiously, oh, yeah. Yeah. guarded or whatever. Yeah, it's tough, man. It's it's it, really really it's tough. It's it's different though because the there has been a little bit of changes though regarding with Disney with the cost cutting, and back in like uh, January and February, uh, it slowly started to trickle down when Iger came. For example, in like uh, Q, like in September and December quarters, they even like their streaming services, one point five billion dollars losses, one point one billion dollar losses, and then in February he wanted to see that you know, bring it down because he wanted to uh, cost cutting. And I feel like now that he wants to be on the board, you don't need to have that guy with you coming in. I feel like oh. it's more like knowing what's the strategy that Bob Iger wants to do. So I feel yeah. like we should trust him. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. I want, I want to trust the guy because actually yeah. I really do believe, I really do believe that 
I think that I don't think Iger is going to put up much of a fight with like the last time we saw Iger really push back, you know, back in February, he was really pushing back against this. And it did, the Walt Disney Company was a, it was an all out PR blitz to, to trash pelts and to the whole thing it was back and forth. I, I was saying on Twitter, I forgot who I was re replying to, um, but I was saying on Twitter that I think it's a real possibility that Pelts and Iger and the and the board they work something out with him and they 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 allow him to come on the board and maybe one other person or something and they work something out because I don't think Iger wants this multi front war. Um, you, he, he can't afford now a, a thing with Pelts on top of everything else. So I think it's in the best interest of the company and even Bob Iger's legacy to just say, hey Pelts, let's work something out and bring you on. Now because I feel like that's a real possibility. I want to trust this guy because I love this company. We all do. And I don't want a snake in the grass, basically. Right. So I want to trust him. So um, I'm encouraged by that, Seymour. I mean, I, you know, hopefully he gets in there with good intentions to actually, you know, want to want to make the Walt Disney Company better. And and we'll see, you know, and George honestly, I, I, I feel like that Iger at this point is desperate. Yeah, I, I think like there's moments where you you see him like before all this occurred, you know, before Chapek took the role and he was and Iger was still the CEO at the time, you know, he kind of had this kind of as I said like the golden CEO, the kind of like the the chip on his shoulder that like he could do no wrong, he could fix all the problems, you know, as long as he's there, he made how many of the acquisitions between Pixar, right. Marvel, and Lucasfilm, you know, he he just he had win after win after win and now it seems like no matter from him leaving and then coming back into the mess that was presented to the company he probably thought okay i could clean this up i could fix it you know i don't think he realized how much of a mess that he <laughs> got put back into as ceo that he inherited right and and it kind of shows from the last uh quarterly earnings i mean you could kind of hear it in his voice i mean he was not having any of the questions from the companies uh from the shareholders what have you he kind of was almost like perturbed where it was like everything that you said to him everything that you asked he kind of had a little bit of a, and I hate to say this, kind of like a cocky attitude. And I feel like it, it's just sh reflecting on the pressure and, and the right. amount of responsibility that he now has to partake in and now trying to get himself out along with the company. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, and here's the thing, too, is like I, there was actually an article today. Um, you know, people close to the situation, right? You know how the news outlets always say that, but supposedly, um, Bob Iger has, has talked to people in his circle saying he's exhausted and why did I come back now? I, if that's true or not, I don't know, <clears throat> but it probably is. I mean, cause as fans, I mean, I think we're all exhausted even just watching it. <laughs> like, yep. like even just watching it it's exhausting i can't imagine being the captain of that ship and and really this is the thing too there's a lot of people like on like on these a lot of content creators and whatnot i'm not gonna i'm not talking crap about anybody but i just feel like a lot of these um creators they don't have a lot of patience with any of this stuff like well I, you know why has niger fixed everything it's like look he, could he have handled things better the last year absolutely absolutely there, there have been mistakes made you know, like, like you said, Seymour there, it, maybe, he, you know, he hasn't gone far enough. The board has been holding him back. There's been a lot of stuff going on, but at the same time, this is a behemoth company. This thing is not going to turn around on a dime. This takes time. And whether it's, whether it was JPEG, whether it's Bob Iger, or whether you fire Bob Iger and you bring someone else in, it's going to be the same situation for the most part. And this isn't, it's not an easy situation to be in. And anyone in this, in this position right now, I think is going to have a hard time with it. It's just, it's, it's hard, difficult to navigate these waters right now, not, you know, and fans don't really have the patience for it, which is unfortunate. Go ahead. Not to mention there's how many different sectors of this company. A lot of people, when they just say, Oh, the Walt Disney company, you think, okay, it's the Walt Disney company. But right. to imagine how many people that are running the parks, how many people that are running ESPN, how many people are running the streaming service, how many people are running the animation studios, Lucasfilm, Marvel, Pixar. It's like there's how many different sectors of this that you have to take into account that it takes time to look at each part of that company and try to fix whatever is going on internally with it. 
well, it's, yeah, and, it's not just one switch. There's the, multiple switches. Multiple switches, and it's rock and a hard place kind of stuff. Look at like for example, look at Disney Plus. So with Disney Plus, they have to pull back on the content um, output because a lot of the content they were churning out with Marvel and Star Wars, it was going so fast that the quality started to come down. So they have to pull back on the content, but at the same time, they have to make this thing profitable. So what do you do? Well, you have to raise prices. Well, that's going to piss fans off, you know. So you you you're, you really can't win here because you have to you have to make your money somehow. So it's either by raising prices or releasing content all the time. Well, Disney can't afford to release content all the time, and then when you raise prices, then people leave. So they're stuck, and th th that's why it's not an easy situation to be in. And it's and easy for a lot of people on the sidelines to be like, "Oh, well, just you know, it's not that easy, y'all. It's not." And that's easy. not, and that's not just Disney situation. That's no. streaming like across yep. how many different companies, too. Right, right. Go ahead, Seymour. No, I was just gonna say a lot of people forget that Disney is the business at the end of the day. Oh, and, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And absolutely. profitability is important for the bottom line. And unfortunately, that's the truth. Even though we love Disney, we're fans of Disney, it's a business at the end of the day. So they need to – their streaming service right now is not making money. Their last quarter, um, it was $500 million loss just on the streaming service itself. It's been going down, but fans are getting upset raising prices. But, yeah, but if you want the service to continue, you're going to have to make money exactly exactly it doesn't just you just can't pull the stuff out of thin air like you know there have to be think there have to be decisions made you know and so that's what a lot of fans don't understand um a lot of people too i see this in the trades and what have you and i'm really curious to your opinion on this seymour where like they're saying that like if pelse comes in maybe he'll oust bob Iger. what are your thoughts on that do you think that would be something that pelse would be interested in uh, ousting bob Iger? Or do you think he'll let the succession plan kind of play itself out? I We don't want another uh, Bob 2.0 scenario. Yeah. The, um, that was a, yeah, that was a mess. I don't think that's going to happen. I think what he wants to do is just to make sure Bob Iger is promising what he's been saying all along, right? Right. To uh, like a number of changes, like reducing costs, streamlining operations, and returning capital to their shareholders. He promised at the end of the year, dividends. Uh, it hasn't been implemented yet, but he's been asking the board for it. Don't know if the board is agreeing with it. This is why sometimes I feel like the board is pushing back on him for this. But those are the changes that Peltz has been asking for, and Bob Iger has been trying to do those changes. Yeah. So I, I, I don't see why they would try to push him out when uh, that would just bring another Bob 2.0 scenario. We don't want I, that. And then we have to... Do it all, do this all again. One hundred percent, Seymour. Well said. Because it's like, yeah, he, there's already a succession plan in place. Like he's want he wants to leave. Obviously, he's exhausted. He said it today, right? Or with the rumor is he said it. Where he wants to leave. So that process is already in motion, and it would be really foolish to for Disney to like cut bait early and have another like you said another JPEG situation. That, that first of all, that's not going to help the stock price. I mean, two CEOs in a year. That's not going to help the stock price at all. So that's going to – the company's going to take a huge hit. And then you have to almost start over again when you bring the new person in and transition into that new the, – the new leadership. So that would be such a mess. And I, I get it. There's a lot of people out there that don't like Bob Iger. He's – He's woke, or he's this, or he's that. Whatever, I get it. He's, you know, he he closed this attraction, or he, or he did this or that, and you don't like him. That's fine. But right now, he is the guy we have, and it would be really, really foolish and really damage the Walt Disney Company if you were to just cut bait right now after you already did that with Bob Chapek. I mean, I don't know if the Walt Disney Company, to be quite honest with you, and this is not hyperbole, I don't know if they could survive that. I I, I don't think switching CEOs right now would be, would be good for them. I think it would be disastrous. Not Absolutely to mention, disastrous. I don't really think they have anybody with the chops for it. I hate, I hate to say it. As much as they can have, it's one thing to have someone who is good at what they do, mm -hmm. but it takes a lot to be a CEO, and that's asking a lot out of a person to go from even a CFO position to a CEO. 
position. Right. So it's almost like, I don't know if in time, but I do agree with you. I do feel like this isn't the time right now to be switching CEOs, but when eventually it does come time for it, I really think that Disney should be looking outside of their company and kind of start kind of preparing said person once they kind of get a good idea of who to bring in to say, hey, here's how things are run. Here's how we do it over here. You know, you can kind of take it with a grain of salt, but like this is our our operations. Kind of right. bring them in, kind of like almost like an internship, so to speak, right. where it, instead of just kind of like throwing them to the wolves, like Iker did for JPEG, which unfortunately I didn't feel like JPEG was the the right guy for CEO, and unfortunately it was just a situation that he was giving the opportunity, he took it, and it didn't go quite well. So yeah, you do, you do not want to repeat that again. So they, Disney needs to be careful that when yeah. they do find a replacement for Iger, it's done properly. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. JPEG, you know, here's the thing with JPEG is like, and I don't think he was as bad as a lot of fans made him out to be, to be honest. Um, I think actually, to be quite honest, I think JPEG is actually a brilliant, a brilliant businessman on a business level. I think he's absolutely brilliant. Um, you put him in any, any other company. If he was running like Coca Cola or something, he would really do well. Disney's a tough ant. Disney's a whole different kind of beast, and it's a very public facing CEO position. I mean, anyone who runs the Walt Disney Company is is basically a celebrity, you know. And it's it's the Uncle Walt syndrome, basically. Everyone now expects that, and so he's just not that guy. But from a business perspective, if he was running any any other company, he would probably do very very well. Um, well, and he did very well in the consumer products division when right. he ran that because he was the one that spearheaded the Disney vault to yeah. release the Disney movies for a certain limited amount of time before it goes back into the vault, like the special edition DVDs and the special edition Blu-rays. I mean, it soared. It was very, it was very successful, and he was the one that spearheaded that. So again, kind of going back to what I was saying, you could take a person; they could be very talented and know what they're doing within their own little comfort zone. But then when you place them in a position where it's like, okay, you got to cover X, Y, and Z instead of just A, <laughs> then it's like it it's a lot to handle. And yeah. that's why I feel like, especially with a company like Disney, I am a firm believer of a dual CEO position. It worked with Walton Roy. It worked with Eisner and Wells. And I feel like it'll work again if they can get two people, one to kind of handle the the face of the company, deal with like the entertainment side, the, the film side, and then you have the business and the finance person to cover right. all the, the numbers and the analytical stuff. Yeah, and actually, JPEG would have been good on that other opposite side of the coin, the, the business and analytics side of it. If you would have had JPEG with a create another creative, and they had like that co CEO position, like you were talking about, that could have worked very well. Now, Seymour, I want to ask you. I want to ask you because this is the first time on the show, so I really want to pick your brain with some of this stuff because we've talked a lot about it here on the channel. But I want to get your take on this, like the CEO succession race right now. So we have what Dana Walden; she's in the running. Tom Staggs, Kevin Meyer, we got Daddy Josh or Josh Diamaro. Um, and I think Kevin Pataro from ESPN is also on the short list, if I'm not mistaken. If I'm missing somebody, correct, you know, you can you can chime and add them in. But off of what based on who we have basically on the chessboard right now, who's who who's got who do you, at the time at right now, as of today, who's kind of in the lead, in your opinion, who's got the best chances? What where do you stand, Seymour? Um it's it's the most obvious answer. It's Tom and Kevin. It's co CEOs. From, from, I agree. From real lips to God's ears. I hope yep, that's who I gets agree. it. <laughs> that that would be my pick. The only issue though is that I don't think they would become co CEOs unless Disney buys Candle Media. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they would have to buy. Yeah, they probably if if we see Disney make a move for Candle Media, it's absolutely happening. Then it's for sure. Um, but you're right. Are they going to leave this company that they successfully like, you know, now? I mean, this company has done very well under these two. Do they really want to ditch that and come to Disney and deal with this mess? Maybe it, not. But if you buy them, like, then, yeah, I was just going to say, or if you uh, entice them with a nice little 
little paycheck, you know, sign it off, you know, I mean, you could pretty much buy anybody with the, with the right price. So, so wait, I mean, sh should I play the money clip then? I mean, are we, are we talking money? We're talking okay. money. Here we go. Here we go. Brand new money, brand new hundreds, got a bunch of zeros, like a bag of new funnies. <laughs> Sorry, that's our money. That's our money drop. So, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, I mean, you can entice them over. I'm sure there's, they, I'm sure you could do it. Right. Um, even with like Bruce Vaughn, you know, the now he's head of Imagineering, but Bruce Vaughn, when he left, he was very successful. I mean, he was running other, he was running companies. He was like a CEO. He was doing a lot of big things outside of Disney and they were man, they managed to lure him in. I'm sure with a ton of promises and money and this whole thing. So yeah, they could bring these two guys in. And that, I agree with you, Seymour. I mean, those are the guys that should be running this thing. Dana Walden, I was on the Dana Walden train for a long time. I, th I think she's, I still think she's very capable, really brilliant lady. Okay, really brilliant woman. But there's been some things with her from what I'm hearing. And, you know, well, you know her stances on like Lucasfilm and stuff like that. I, I, I think that they, Ken, Kathleen Kennedy, I think she's a great producer. But I think it's time for her to kind of move on. We bring someone new in. From what I understand, Dana Walden is is against that. They he wants she wants to keep her on board, which is fine. But I just feel like it's time for some fresh eyes in that studio. And when I heard that, and it was a rumor, to be fair, but when I heard that, I'm like, uh, my my idea, my my perception of her kind of changed. But she's very smart. She's very capable. I mean, she would, I think she would do okay in that position. Um. But I don't know. She lost some points with me with that Kathleen Kennedy thing. Um, I think I think Tom Staggs, he was just the goat. He ran the he was CFO, the chief financial officer for all those years. He did very well in that role. They they he went from that to the parks chief. I mean, polar opposite divisions. And then he crushed it over at the parks division with Pandora and Galaxy's Edge and New Fantasyland. I mean, this guy is just any role you put him in, he absolutely excels. Kevin Meyer. That was Bob Iger's uh, acquisition guy. Every acquisition that Bob Iger made, it was with Kevin Meyer right there. He was the one who that kind of wa went through that whole process with Bob Iger. Bob Iger's entire legacy is is basically um, hinges upon all those acquisitions, and that's because of Kevin Meyer. So you take both of those guys and you have them run the Walt Disney Company. Oh, I'm telling you, it's it's gold. It's absolute gold. And I'll tell you what, too, see more to your point. We have all these CEO candidates, Dana, Daddy Josh, all these CEO candidates. And recently, I think it was back in July, because we were at Walt Disney World when the news broke, George. Mm -hmm. Back in July, it was it was said that Bob Iger reached out to Staggs and Meyer at, for as consultants for linear television. Why would you do that if you have five very capable CEO candidates in-house? Why would you reach out? Obviously, Iger doesn't seem too thrilled with his current crop <laughs> that he feels the need to reach out, you know? Yep. Right? It's, it's crazy. Now, speaking of linear TV, Seymour, I want to ask you, what's going on with that? What's going to happen? Are they going to sell off ESPN and all that stuff? What do you think, man? Um, ESPN, no. But I think what they're going to do is sell the networks and not the studios. And that's where a lot of people get a bit confused. So when they're selling ABC, they're not going to sell the studios that make the content for ABC. They're going to sell the network that's on cable and the news uh, the news portion of it as well. Okay. That would that would be interesting and that would be a, I think that would be a smart move. I think I would so, I would be fine with that, you know. Exactly. So when you're seeing these reports that they're going to sell ABC, they're going to sell ESPN, they're not really going to sell those they're going to sell the network that's being played on the linear platforms because, as Iger said, linear is not core to Disney anymore. It's not. And nice. streaming is the future. And I can see a, the future where Disney Plus and Hulu merges and you'll get your live content there as well. Bingo. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. D linear TV is it's a dinosaur at this point. It's, 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 it's slowly dying and it's been dying for a while now. And streaming has kind of expedited that. You know, um, what, what do you think, George, uh, in terms of selling off assets, linear TV, or if there's other stuff you think that they might sell off? What do you think? You know, I mean, yeah, I, I think at this point, linear TV is is pretty much no one cares about it. <laughs> it's completely irrelevant. Um, it's not going to bring in any money coming into the company. Um, so for them to hold on to it, they're basically losing money. I mean, they do have to get a grasp on the streaming 
platforms. You know, I think maybe they have to try to configure that first before they sell off the the linear television because once you do that, then you have to fully focus just on the streaming service and i feel like they haven't really found their niche yet with that yeah. um to kind of get a grasp on where they're actually making a profit you know it kind of did well out of the gate you know because it was brand new it was a brand new streaming service for disney you know people were all hyped up for it then 2020 came there was nothing much people could do but sit inside and watch streaming service so i mean it basically was their bread and butter at the time um, because the parks were closed on, you know, people weren't really traveling or doing anything. But now, since everything has reopened back up, people are trying to get, you know, get back to their their own norm. And it's now Disney has to kind of readjust the streaming service, not to the terms of how it was back in 2020, but now how it is with everything that is now reopened back up again. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. What we're seeing right now is a total seismic shift at Disney. And I think just in Hollywood in general, I think it's just, mm -hmm. I think in five years from now, I think Hollywood's going to look very different, you know? And you can even see Disney testing the waters with this, uh, transitioning to streaming. Uh, for example, dancing with the stars, uh, which I think is actually playing right now. <laughs> um, yeah, it is actually my mom's watching it. So they, <laughs> So if you're watching it live on Disney Plus, they actually have ads. Oh, interesting. Okay. So okay, and I can see that that's where they're going to be with their future revenues when they have their live content. They're going to implement ads and produce much more, uh, uh, increase their margins in regarding streaming, because I think yeah. ads is the push that Disney and all the other streaming companies need to do. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're right on that. Absolutely. That that's the future. That's where they're headed. That's where they're headed. Now, one last question I want to ask you guys uh, before we go, because we're talking streaming. I, I, I'm confused with this whole thing because I, I, I heard, and I could be mistaken, but I, I thought that Disney and Comcast had to, I thought that they were going to settle this by September 30th, the whole like Hulu thing. I thought that that's when they agreed mm -hmm. upon it, but it hasn't happened yet. Like, so I don't know if that was like, I guess did it was extend. Did they extend out the, 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 I, the, the vote or the decision or however that works. I'm really not sure. I guess it wasn't like a hard date or whatever, but I thought it was September 30th. I guess not. Seymour, do you, do you know what's going on with the Comcast uh, Hulu thing? Have you heard uh, anything? Unfortunately, no. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't, I don't really know. I mean, that's interesting. I don't know. We'll see what happens with that. That's going to be a tough and, one too, because it's a actually, lot of money. If we could actually add on to that, because there's a lot of speculation right. right now that's going on, that there's a possibility that Universal might purchase Warner Brothers. Oh, and that's, that's a can of worms. <laughs> that's, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's interesting, because then you then have uh, all the, the, the Warner Brother IP, you know, and, and, and Universal gets their hands on that you know, then that's going to give Disney a run for their money, you know? So it's now, again, that's all speculation. If universal decides to down the road. Well, and if they're even allowed to, because the regulatory process is going to nitpick that thing. Cause that's going to be a massive company, yeah. you know? And, oh, yeah, and that's, yeah, that's not going to be, yeah, that's not going to be uh, pennies and dimes <laughs> well, to, well, to acquire that. Well, no. And, and these companies, like people think like, okay, like Comcast is just going to like stay the way it is and just buy Warner brothers. Now there's going to be the, you know, this mega, like if Comcast were to make that move and buy Warner brothers, they would almost certainly have to sell off certain things. Cause there would be, there would be, um, oh, like overlap, you know, overlap. Yeah. Yeah. And monopoly issues and all kinds of stuff that would be involved in it to get it through that regulatory process. You'd have to sell stuff. I know Disney, when they bought Fox, they had to sell the Fox sports stuff because it was, it was a monopoly issue or whatever. They, 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 right. it, they, had, they had, there was a deadline that they had to sell that stuff by. Do you think universal could have kind of like in the notion where they, how Disney did sort of like with Pixar, mm -hmm. where it was like Pixar could be Pixar, even though Disney owns it but they have their kind of own name brand where they can own Warner brothers, but still let Warner brothers be the company that they are currently without being purchased. Well, well, no, well they would, well, I think they would, no, well, I think they would purchase it, but they, but I mean like, let it still be like their own. Yo, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Cause Warner yeah. brothers is one of those brands where it's like, it's, it's it, Warner brothers is actually a really strong brand. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I would argue it's, 
it's stronger than a lot of the stuff Universal has, in my opinion. And so I think that they would definitely want to lean into that Warner Brothers branding. Yeah, I don't think they would just like erase all the Warner Brothers references. I think they would they would they would just own that studio and they would embrace it. You know, like you said, like what they do with Pixar or Marvel or any of that. So what do you think about that, Seymour? What, what, what do you think about this idea of, of, of Comcast buying Warner Brothers? This rumor has been going around a lot. And this one that dropped today was actually from Variety. So it's not just from some Joe Schmo site. This is from the Hollywood trade. Uh, as a business, I understand why. Comcast doesn't have strong IPs. You look at their parks, most of them are from other companies. You, their number one IP at the parks is Mario. Like, that's not... That's not Universal. That's Nintendo. Right. Yep. And when yeah. you buy Warner Brothers, you're going to get this explosion of IPs from Scooby-Doo, DC. Yeah. It's, it just makes sense. It makes total sense. And then you have all the Harry Potter stuff already in your parks. But but here's the thing. You're absolutely right. Right now, they're renting Harry Potter. They got to they gotta pay J.K. Rowling to use it. They got to go through hoops and make her happy. Well, you buy the Warner Brothers, you buy Warner Brothers, and now you eliminate a lot of that, right? Because now you own the movies, you own the IP. It just it just opens all kinds of stuff up for them, you know. Yeah. And like you know, they, they have now they have a whole a whole genre, um, a whole superhero studio with DC. Now they can compete directly with Marvel. I mean, it would be a game changer for them. I mean, that would be something else, you know. That would be really, really something else. And you're right, Seymour. They, I, I've been saying this for a long time too, brother. Like the the Universal IP is really on the struggle bus. Their in-house stuff is really weak, you know. And th it's all the outside stuff, the Nintendo, the Harry Potter, all that stuff that's really bringing in the people to those to those parks. And I mean, it's not Madagascar, okay? <laughs> It's 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 they have Potter and the Nintendos, and you know if Universal could acquire the Warner Brothers library. Because, you know, the Warner Brothers library is actually very, very strong. It's just been really mismanaged over the past 20 plus years, ever since AOL and, and WB merged back in like the early 2000s. That studio has been like really mismanaged, but they have great properties. That's the frustrating thing, you know? And I think if, if, if Comcast were to like kind of like manage those properties better, I'm telling you, man, they, I mean, with the Looney Tunes, you got Animaniacs, all that. You have a lot of great content, Scooby Doo. You could do a lot plus, with it. Yeah, plus you get the streaming service, Max. That's true. Because like Peacock is not doing as great as all the other streaming services. And Comcast right now, their primary their primary business is uh, cable and internet. So when that is trickling down because linear is dying, people are canceling their cable, just keeping internet or even 5G for the future. You got to look elsewhere for businesses. And I can see them trying to get... There, I was going to say HBO Max, Max now, <laughs> and get all that IP and integrate it throughout all their businesses. Yeah. Oh, 100%. 100%. So we'll keep an eye on it. You know, we'll keep an eye on it. A lot of people are kind of like, I see a lot on Twitter, like kind of brushing this off, like, oh, it, it'll never happen. The, 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 the regulatory, it'll never make it through the regulatory process. We don't know that because we don't know what Comcast is willing to offload to acquire Warner Brothers, you know? So we'll see. And there's been so much smoke with this thing. I mean, this is a rumor that that rears its head every five to six months. There's something going on here with this. So we'll keep an eye on it. And Seymour, I would love to have you back on. We could we could talk. If, if we get an official word on that, we'll definitely have you back on and talk about it yeah, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. You're always welcome back on the show, man. Talk and shop with us. Um, if you could let everybody at home know where they can find you on social media. Yeah, you can find me on uh, x.com slash Mr. Seymour Duck. There he is. So follow this follow this man on um, on X. I will link his, uh, his, his Twitter or his X account in the description below. And again, Seymour, thank you so much for coming on, brother. And right over here, we got the Italiano, Mr. George Citrus, host of our show here on the channel, uh, Citrus Corner, our Walt Disney World show. George, if you could let everybody at home know where they could find you on uh, social media. Absolutely. You could find me on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Disney George. You could also find me on the podcast called A Walk with Walt. And of course, you'll find me here on my home base at Orange Grove 55 with Citrus Corner with all that sweet, juicy, but sometimes sticky Disney news and info. Perfect, perfect. Now, I do want, I do want to give a little quick little programming note. Uh, last night, we recorded with the 
the gentleman over at the Bad Thoughts podcast, um, Candid Camper and Tones. Great guys. We love those two guys. They just started a new podcast called the Bad Thoughts Podcast that should get released, I think, tomorrow is what they said. I mean, we'll see. But um, we'll share it out, obviously, when it does get uploaded. But um, it's 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 an adult show, though, just so people know. It's not for kids. It's an adult conversation, most of it, and all that stuff. That's kind of what they do over there, you know? But we had a fantastic time. Laugh. It was just so many laughs. Really fun conversation. So make sure you keep an eye out for that. It's the Bad Thoughts Podcast. And, you know, they're on YouTube, so check them out on YouTube. Subscribe to them. But uh, again, Seymour, thank you for coming on. George the Italiano, thank you for coming on. Everybody at home, comment down below with all your thoughts on everything we talked about. Nelson Peltz, uh, Warner Brothers Universal, Bob Iger, the CEO stuff, everything. We would love to hear from you. And as always, have a wonderful, wonderful day. Bye-bye, everybody. Brand new money, brand new hundreds. Got a bunch of zeros like a bag of new funyuns.